Today's video is sponsored by Call of Dragons. It's no secret I'm a Left 4 Dead fanatic, and over the last seven years the channel has covered Left 4 Dead related material time and time again. I've compared Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 as games themselves before, and I've discussed the characters and the infected and the virus ad nauseum. But you know what? Of the two groups of four survivors, which one worked as a band of people slapped together due to circumstances better? If given the exact same situations from the start, who would last the longest? Well today, we are tallying up the score and talking that up as we pit the two groups of four against each other. Today, we are discussing which group of survivors is better, Left 4 Dead 1 versus Left 4 Dead 2. While we may be pitting both groups of Left 4 Dead survivors up against each other, starting today you can heed the call to pit yourself up against ruthless behemoths with today's sponsor, Call of Dragons. Call of Dragons is an MMO fantasy conquest ripe with recruiting elven maidens, orcs, and a litany of magical heroes. Band together to take down giant behemoths and expand your territory. But in order to do so, you'll have to use your entire squad's power to your best capabilities, and with the abilities of the Beastmaster, can you rein in these giant giant monsters and can control them to be all your own. Use the Magma Demon to heal your squad or the Flame Dragon to turn your enemies to ash. By roaming this diverse world of deadly monsters over 3.88 kilometers in diameter, you can train your behemoth with your alliance to meet your battle needs, but only the most skilled can tame these ravaged beasts. Survival is also key as you manage your resources and build your bases and citadels to war against opposing factions to claim coveted resources and reign supreme amongst all those in Tamaris. Unearth ancient relics, explore the lore of this new world, and discover untold treasure in Call of Dragons. Master dragons to rule this world. Download Call of Dragons using my link below or scan the QR code right here and become a beast master today to get special rewards in game. Magic Monsters Mastery, huzzah! Can you survive? Let me know in the comments and let's see who can survive a bit better amongst the Left 4 Dead survivors. Leaving the safe room, there's some things we need to take note of. We will be looking over the histories, capabilities, and mentalities of each survivor. Not only that, but how that equates to them functioning as a four-man unit, and how that would lead to an effective squad against the zombie <clears throat> infected apocalypse. We won't be taking into account canonical events that force certain people to endgame themselves or put their last known whereabouts and where they possibly ended up as their ultimate terms of survivability. We also won't be giving the first group an advantage for surviving the green flu outbreak one week longer than the second group. Just because you got early access don't mean you are any better. Both groups were able to get across long stretches of the U.S. landscape with their own challenges and struggles unique to their environments. And hell, the first group didn't even have to deal with spitters, chargers, and jockeys, nor did they know how to use melee weapons until near the end of their journey. We will be putting them on an equal playing field, acting as if both groups had the exact same circumstances of location, stage of public green flu infection, and similar arsenals. Of course, every survivor here is immune, or more, a carrier of the virus, meaning they will never succumb to its full zombification-like effects, but can still spread it to non-immune individuals. So for the most part, whoever they come in contact with will most likely turn or meet a swift demise, because that's usually what happens. So it'll always boil down to the core four. And when it comes to getting down to each survivor's essence, I will be taking more into account their backstories, characteristics, physiques, and lifestyles prior to the outbreaks into consideration instead of all of them being on an equal playing field for gameplay purposes. Because, let's face it, a college girl that watches movies all day probably can't take as much of a beating as a biker who regularly gets himself into fights and trouble with the law. We will also be simplifying things to a ratings and scoring system to accumulate for each team and tally them up at the end, separated into these categories on a scale of 1 to 5. First, stamina and strength. Second, weapon proficiency. Third, cooperativeness. And last, survival preparedness. All crucial for surviving a zombie apocalypse in more ways than one, each survivor excelling in some portions, learning as they go, or just outright being hell in a handbasket real fast. So with that, let's get things going with the Northeastern squad of Left 4 Dead 1 and start with the OG himself. A grizzled, battle-hardened veteran that served two duties during the Vietnam War. 
Bill is the definitive survivor from the get-go. Despite suffering a permanent knee injury due to shrapnel in his leg, he got around just fine in his civilian life. Having to undergo surgery right as he was being placed under anesthesia did his nurse become infected and kill the nearby medical staff. Being the badass that he is, Bill not only shook off the effects of the anesthesia, but was able to kill the infected nurse and fight a number of infected armed with only a bone saw and knife through the hospital. Returning to his apartment did he dress in his military apparel and, and arm up. Having no immediate family of his own, he eventually found his group and became the de facto leader of the Ragtag Bunch. Just from that introduction into the apocalypse alone did Bill prove himself in terms of everything we're about to talk about. All he had known for most of his life was how to fight and with the advent of a zombie uprising did he find his purposes met. While Bill may be a veteran with an unshakable will, no man can shake the ravages of time and prior injury. Despite being ready to go in just about all scenarios, his body may sometimes struggle to keep up with him, especially due to his knee injury, often proclaiming how much he hates stairs and how he will limp when critically injured compared to other survivors. He is also constantly smoking cigarettes, which is not the best if you're trying to keep your cardio up. This all does not detract from how durable he is to take large amounts of damage, having a high pain tolerance, and resisting even being medically knocked out, and also literally kicking the damn mouth off a damn infected while blacking out. This puts his stamina and strength at a 5 out of 5. His time in the United States Army and armed conflict would definitely give him a 4 out of 5 in terms of weapon proficiency, especially given the fact he was freely able to fight the infected with only what he could find with his ass flopping out. That and having an M16 at the ready at his own home means he knows how to use it, whether from attending firing ranges or just from it coming second nature to him. This puts his weapon proficiency at a 5 out of 5 and in turn really puts his survival preparedness at a 5 out of 5 as well. Considering his know-how and how to maneuver through crowded cities, wanting to use a sailboat for aquatic travel, proclaiming that those that run around looking for gas are idiots. I mean, who would do that? And he is just the guy everyone looks to in order to figure out what the next course of action should be. Surviving in the midst of war, having to lie low, knowing when to attack or retreat, finding food, and just surviving in general puts him as probably the most capable person for this category. As much as his cooperativeness with people can be very finicky despite growing close to his group, while the means of how he came together with this group and decided to stick together with them will forever be lost to the canonical sands of Valve as they never showed how they met up, Bill is shown to be very hesitant to speak to others, even willing to sacrifice other people for the good of his group. But that still begs the question of why he even banded together with them in the first place. He often quarrels with Francis over many subjects and acts as a stern generic military officer out in the field, but treats Lewis pretty averagely and Zoe as if his own daughter. His reluctance at accepting help unless forced to, a la escape vehicles, is in both ways commendable, but also can bite them. His strict behavior could rub some people the wrong way, but still gets the job done, even if his connection to the group is ultimately what cost him his own life, as that his cooperativeness is at a 4 out of 5. Zoe being a laid-back college student that spent more time researching horror movies involving zombies, slashers, and aliens instead of attending class. One night, while infection numbers were ramping up, her mother was assaulted in their home and infected, causing her mother to bite her father. Zoe's father quickly killed her mother before she could reach Zoe, and then Zoe had to kill her own dad before he turned, since both of them knew what the means of infection most certainly was. Zoe is a caring person and tries her best to help anyone in need. She is willing to work with anyone, even those that consistently piss her off. Although the military base did want to keep them locked up and or gunned down for their potential threats or curative potential. It's because of this we put her cooperativeness at a 4 out of 5. Still, being a college-age girl who spends most of her time watching movies, one can imagine she isn't the most physically fit. While still thin and able to run easily, it'd be hard to see Zoe being able to withstand as much damage as Bill or Francis. 
because once again, we can't put them all on the same level as each other as if we are playing a game. Based solely on her physique and lifestyle prior, I would put her stamina and strength at the bottom level of three. As for her knowledge of firearms, she actually has some history there. She would attend to sessions at the firing range with her police officer father quite regularly, although it's most likely that she didn't have access to the wide variety of firearms she did in the games. So it's doubtful she knew much about operating something like a shotgun with tons of kickback. But regardless, it's better having training in some firearms rather than none at all, especially with the cop teaching you the basics. Each survivor within the game has a preferred weapon they will always pick up as a bot. And for Zoe, that is between the submachine guns and hunting rifle, so she can work effectively at range. I would put her weapon proficiency on the high end of a 3 out of 5. And as being prepared for this all, yeah, watching movies and knowing fully well what zombies are and how they work is valuable knowledge. At this point in American culture though, most, if not all people, know how zombies work anyway. Even if some believe the pandemic to be vampiric in nature. She does know how to act accordingly with the zombie apocalypse though, since she didn't hesitate long to kill her infected father despite barely knowing what was going on. Her lifestyle as a lazy college student didn't do much in preparing her for everything else that comes with a zombie apocalypse. It doesn't matter how many games you play or movies you watch, it's not preparing you for a zombie apocalypse if you don't get off your ass. So we would have to put her survival preparedness at a 2 out of 5. Rising up in the world of Philadelphia, Lewis found comfort in the field of a systems analyst. Systems analyst. Systems analyst. All right! Keeping a positive demeanor about just about everything he would come across, some co-workers of his found his positivity to be a bit too enthusiastic. Spending most of his time working, he would frequently play video games at home as his hobby, referencing games like Half-Life and even keeping figures of TF2's heavy on his office desk. Man, I feel like I'm Gordon Freeman and even lamenting about not having an Xbox in the outbreak. During his office lunch breaks, instead of grabbing a bite to eat, Lewis would frequent the local gun range to sharpen his skills, and probably quell his inner rage for playing Team Fortress 2 so frequently to probably keep himself so positive. When news started reporting how badly this outbreak was getting, Lewis's co-workers expressed deep concern, while Lewis simply said it was all being blown out of proportion like news media tends to do. Until Lewis went to go take a shit and an infected crawled into his stall, zombie land style. After being bitten and killing the rabid man, Lewis walked out to see the office destroyed, with the world outside plunged into chaos, all during one shit break. Lewis's denial was all but rendered null as he gawked at his fresh bite wound. Soon finding refuge with the three other survivors did he find his place as the source of positive reinforcement and educated knowledge when it came to traversing areas and using certain tools. His time as an office worker and proficient gamer didn't give him much in terms of strength and stamina to work with. Not being very active in his social life and sitting in front of computers all day can really slow you down. Although, he does encourage Bill to engage in cardio like it is a regular part of his own life. Although, that is purely speculation. This puts his stamina and strength at a 2 out of 5. Actively going to a firing range, just like Zoe, does mean he won't be completely clueless when it comes to arming up when the time comes. Although, again, much like Zoe, his available arsenal at the range probably wasn't ever diverse, especially within the time constraints of a workday lunch. Plus, playing games like Half-Life and TF2 isn't going to translate too much to real-world running and gunning. Although, researching back through my old Survivor profiles, remembering that Lewis has the know-how to craft pipe bombs? I mean, that is a plus for zombie survival, but it honestly makes you think, was he about to go American Psycho at his workplace? With all that being said, the pipe bomb info slightly pushes Lewis to a 4 out of 5 on weapon proficiency. Lewis is definitely more than willing to work with anyone that is available and attempts to keep everyone in good spirits. At a definitive foil to the consistent pessimism of Francis we will get to shortly, the only person Lewis shows any disapproval for is Nick. You're right, Francis. He's not friendly. I think Bill would have shot him by now. Oh yeah! Although you could say Nick is his polar opposite. Regardless, Lewis is able to establish warm relationships with others easily and help guide the group with his knowledgeable side. And having someone communicate against the folly of most people's despair will come in handy, especially when trying to contact rescue vehicles and other survivors. Lewis reigns supreme in his cooperativeness with a 5 out of 5. 
and dialing back to the gamer office worker lifestyle, it doesn't really offer much in terms of preparations for a post-apocalypse. It doesn't matter how many survival games you play, it's not going to make food gathering and settlement creating easy. He knows how to shoot and make pipe bombs, but that is more in line for a domestic terrorist or a doomsday prepper ready to rip and tear, and doesn't offer much in day-to-day -day survival except defense, putting his survival preparedness at a 2 out of 5. Now bringing in the muscle of the OG crew. Francis spent his last pre-apocalypse days attempting to steal a flat screen TV only to be caught by the cops and given only days until his incarceration. Attending the local bar with his biker friends, Francis is taken away by one of his lady love interests trying to get in a quickie. However, during their intimate moment does she bite him a little too hard as she turns into an infected soon after being killed by his friend Duke. Francis reveled in the idea of a zombie apocalypse as he went to the bar's rooftop, whipped out a big bag of guns with his crew, hauling up a jukebox to the rooftop to play music at full blast, and proceeded to mow down zombies with his gang. Whatever happened to his fellow bikers is completely unknown, but it's safe to assume with the Green Flu's capabilities to go airborne, or just simply being bitten, that they all turned, forcing Francis to find another group to survive with. Being the de facto leader of his ragtag bunch of bikers, Francis his self-centered lifestyle would have to take a back seat to Bill's leadership who had more experience working as a unit trying to survive instead of evading the law. He would also find himself constantly talking out loud how much he hated everything he came into contact with. I hate stairs. I hate subways. I hate sewers. I hate hospitals and doctors and lawyers and cops. I hate elevators. I hate train yards. I hate small towns. I hate the water. I hate the woods. I hate tunnels. I hate vans. I hate Ayn Rand. I hate steam. You're fired. As well as quarreling with other survivors and intentionally goading them, looking for a verbal or physical fight with intentional misinformation or personal jabs. With his personality in tow and negativity in tow, I would have to give his cooperativeness a 1 out of 5. It's actually a total wonder how the hell Francis ended up with this group, but it was most likely for the fact that every group needs a bruiser, someone who can handle heavy duty lifting and damage. And Francis, standing 6 foot 5 inches, or 195 centimeters tall for everyone else that doesn't understand freedom, with a history of brawling, getting himself injured, and running from the law, has built himself up to be a formidable zombie killer. Hell, dude had some flesh ripped out of his neck and he said he would still do a conjugal visit with the infected woman that bit him. With that, I would give his stamina and strength a 5 out of 5. Also, dialing back to his backstory, once Francis discovered the zombie apocalypse was nigh, it took him no time flat to bring out a big bag of assorted guns to proceed to mow down supposedly 1,000 infected with his squad, utilizing his favorite class, the shotgun, although rifles can be noted among the mix in the bag. Given his time as a prominent member of the Hell's Legion, it's a given he would know his way around a firearm anyways, so I would put his weapon proficiency at a 4 out of 5. And being an active criminal, he probably knows the best, or in the comic sway's worst, methods of running from a threat. Although running from the cops is not advisable, it is way more effective in running from full sprint infected. Having to live off what the road lays out for him in his travels and just being able to live wherever he can for the night is a definite plus. And being completely willing to start gunning and running and anything with reckless abandon in this scenario is an additional buff. But these are all just the lifestyle of a drifter, so I'd put his survival preparedness a 3 out of 5. And so with that, we have the total tally of the Pennsylvanian survivors shown here. Showing in terms of strength, stamina, and weapon proficiency, they are well off in fighting the infected while also being able to keep up and running and gunning as they go. Despite some cooperativeness being pretty shaky, the four as a unit make them at least above average, and their time together would only strengthen those numbers as time led on. But that would be for many others in this dire situation. They may not have been the most prepared for survival as it is their weakest link. They evenly work with each other's strengths and weaknesses 
weaknesses in order to get the job done with shooting first and maybe asking questions later for anyone that picks up a radio, unless you work in a church. So how do they stack up against their southern counterparts? Will the South rise again, or will the seemingly more dysfunctional rooftop meetup crew fall apart faster? Well, you know, we gotta start with the man, the myth, the <laughs> cheeseburger legend himself. Got there right! The de facto leader of the New Orleans Bound Posse, Coach earned his moniker due to his career as the defensive coordinator for a Savannah High School freshman football team. Much like Bill, Coach had a promising career ahead of him. Although not in the line of fire fighting for freedom, he suffered a heavy knee injury that halted his time as a defensive lineman for college football. It's from his time working as part of a team and the coach of a team that he learned how to make a group work together while still wrapping it in the comfort of some good old southern hospitality. He can be stern and stubborn, but reasonable offering him a cooperativeness of about a 4 out of 5. He is basically a father figure to both Rochelle and Ellis, and kind of a rival leader type to the pessimistic Nick. Even when others are grinding his gears or not lifting their weight, he still pushes to get them to work towards their goals as any high school football coach would. Coach can be known to take his fair share of debilitating hits, but years of being inactive on the football field and telling teenagers what to do instead, compounded with his rather unhealthy eating habits, have led him to gain some weight. He'll sometimes lament having to run long periods without stopping for food, but it's not like he's passing out or getting eaten alive like the fat guy in Zombieland. Being akin to Bill in that they both have attributes that slow down what could have been perfect survivors, although Bill's detriment was just old age, while Coach is 265 pounds. But that's okay, more to love, baby. He can still easily use his innate strength to be the secondary muscle of the group, so his stamina and strength would land on the low end of a 3 out of 5. Unlike the extensive backgrounds of the OG survivors who had a full comic to flesh out each of their backgrounds, the Left 4 Dead 2 survivors were not so lucky to be given a, well, they like going to the firing range occasionally. But being a man of the South coach, I would say it's just second nature for him to pick up a gun and fire decently well. He prefers the use of shotguns, and his bulky physique would allow him to handle the kickback those suckers punch with. With this limited history of coach with firearms prior to the outbreak, I'd still see him being knowledgeable of how to operate most and put his weapon proficiency at the low end of a 3 out of 5. But man, if there's one thing I don't see Coach preparing for, it's an end of world scenario. Becoming heavily dependent on fried foods and prepared meals and coaching high schoolers, those attributes don't really translate well into living long term against the green flu pandemic. If there's one thing Left 4 Dead never explains, it's how any of the survivors stay hydrated and fed. And I can imagine it would be harder for Coach with all the exhaustive trekking he has to do and the diet that he has had for years. I would put Coach survival preparedness at a 2 out of 5. A sensible woman with a love for jokes and just trying to work things out with the best outcome possible, Rochelle was a low-level assistant producer for Eyewitness 10 News, purely doing grunt work for them. When staff started calling in sick during the outbreak, she took the chance to anchor amid the Savannah evacuations, but her time in front of the camera was cut extremely short as she found herself on a hotel rooftop with three dysfunctional men failing to evacuate via helicopter. Her work in cable news being the behind-the-scenes person doing everyone's choice and labor did give Rochelle a knack for running around as much as she did. She was out working to the best of her capabilities, but does that translate well to the world of a zombie-like outbreak? She definitely has the stamina to keep herself on the move, but in terms of strength and durability, lugging cables around and fetching a producer his coffee doesn't mean much for keeping a gun steady and fending off dozens of cannibalistic mutating monsters, which makes me wonder, how is she? Have you tried swinging a frying pan or sword repeatedly? It is not as easy as a video game character would make it look like. So with that, I would put her stamina and strength at about a 2 out of 5. Rochelle is probably the least experienced survivor when it comes to handling a firearm, as when she first picks up a pistol in Dead Center. <laughs> wow! 
Give me a break. It's the first time I've shot a gun. It would be most likely that her use of guns would just have to be learned on the spot and taught by the gentleman around her, putting her weapon proficiency at a 2 out of 5. While she has struggled to keep up the numbers so far, what she lacks in brawn and gun, she makes up for in communication skills and team building exercises. She stays level-headed in most situations and tries to remain kind and thoughtful to everyone, including Nick. While her humor is drier than mine, it comes off as charming and deflates the seriousness of what's going on to keep things a little more tame mentally for others. When strife or struggle begins to arise with others, either within her group or those she encounters, she always tries to find a sensible way to settle things before they get too heated and come to a reasonable conclusion. Much like Coach being the father figure of the group, Rochelle acts as the big sister, coaxing others to better themselves or get over their traits that bogged down progress. Her cooperativeness will definitely be top tier at a 5 out of 5. Her time working at the news station would also have her wanting to know more about the world and keeping an ear out for news and important information. While she isn't anything like a doomsday prepper, she stays well informed and can bring a lot to the table in terms of where her group should go to find refuge and can easily pick out spots to hide and find food potentially. Her survival preparedness due to her time at the news station would be on the very low end of of four out of five. A man that loves to reminisce of stories past and a redneck with a love for guns, friends, and working hard, Ellis spent his pre-apocalypse life as a mechanic for a local garage that does some wild adventures with his buddy Keith in his spare time. Ellis quickly took to his new group of friends and would quickly become the overly energetic, can-do youngin' of the squad. Ellis's time with his buddy Keith would reveal he has gotten into many dangerous situations. If this were Keith's score, that motherfucker would be a 10 out of 5, but we are talking about our boy Ellis. He has been caught up in the crossfire his fair share of times, and his time working in the garage would at least be enough to keep his strength at a fair level, while his teenage-like antics would keep his stamina relatively high as well. Also being a young man with intense virility, he believes himself to be invincible, brushing off any damage he takes. He views the zombie apocalypse as not all that bad, and anything that happens is just part of the experience. This down-home country boy earns a 5 out of 5 for stamina and strength. Ellis is the definition of a fun-loving redneck. And what do fun-loving rednecks love more than cars, drinking, and hollering? Guns, baby! Don't get me wrong, not every southerner is good with a gun. But look at our boy Ellis. You know that boy can fire a weapon. Ellis, get the guns out of your basement and meet me at the Vena Hotel. <laughs> what? I don't got no guns. Your family's redneck, Ellis. There's bound to be a gun in your house somewhere. Hey, there was a gun in my house. I told you, Ellis. All right, Ellis, shoot that gun. I don't know how to fire a gun. Ellis, how many times do we have to go through this? You're a redneck, you can shoot a gun. I'm getting sick of your stereotypes. Be as sick as you want, just shoot that damn zombie. Hell, Ellis even states that he learned how to shoot a gun before he could even walk and is happy to pick up any gun he could find and fire it with enthusiastic precision. His weapon proficiency is a 5 out of 5. Ellis is more than willing to work with anyone and much like Lewis, is ripe with unbridled optimism towards anything and everyone, except those goddamn zombies. He is strong-willed and willing to do what he can to help and even save others when the time calls for it. Although his headstrong nature and talkativeness can sometimes be an ever so slight burden in hour to hour operations, he is still a team player willing to do anything for his friends and family. We'll put his cooperativeness at a four out of five. Now, while Ellis views the pandemic as a way of just having fun, his time beforehand having all sorts of wacky adventures puts him in spots where just being prepared for anything was a must. Although his naive, boyish charms would make for a less than intelligent way of going about things, as every choice going forward would mean life or death. Not having any fear for day-to-day -day survival is a damn good thing, but it pales in comparison for being prepared and thinking rationally before running headfirst into every situation. His constant rambling of Keith, which makes me think he leans a certain way, would make unnecessary noise that she'd want to avoid, and wanting to have fun at every corner would put him and others into dangerous threats that would have easily been avoided. But even then, his susceptibility to work...
Goddamn phone. His susceptibility to working with others only has him as the way of weaker and less stamina driven survivors to get the job done. So think of his survival skills as an accessory, a brawn to give the brain some breathing room to plan, most of the time with adult supervision. His survival preparedness gets placed at a country five, three out of five. Probably the man you'd trust the least from the get-go, spending a majority of his life going from city to city, scamming and shysting people of their money. Nick is a criminal with a shady past and a nice suit. Working alone and banging anything that moved, Nick found himself never trusting a soul to make headway with his lifestyle, where he had hoped to swindle riverboat gamblers in Savannah before he was forced to evacuate and get stuck with a loud girl, hayseed, and tons of fun. He generally is disliked by most, as he is brazen, insults others from the get-go, and genuinely doesn't want to make connections with anyone. Just from his attitude, interactions, and history, we are instantly putting his co-op points on the low end of a 1 out of 5. His life in the criminal underground has put himself at his fair share of precarious predicaments. Just from his dialogue does he reveal that he legally isn't allowed to have a firearm, knows how to use first aid kits to their best capabilities, and he even knows how to get brain matter out of suits and blood out of wedding dresses. His extensive bad guy background means he has been through enough stuff to deal with taking out others and probably getting himself injured near fatally since first aid kits are second nature to him. Nick, however, seems to get winded rather easily, meaning most of his con work is in a relaxed environment and would rather resort to fighting rather than flying. With that history under his belt, we can say his stamina and strength is at a 3 out of 5. This may seem a bit low, but this factors more in favor of his firearms and survival. He is no stranger to using a gun. Him having blood on his hands or his suit and being banned from owning firearms means either he is a convicted felon or was charged with a misdemeanor involving a weapon. But considering his um, career path, it's easy to say he is most definitely a guy that knows his way around just about any type of gun and will put his weapon proficiency at about a 4 out of 5. His life as a loner drifting town to town, fighting and killing those that cross him and doing whatever is possible to achieve his goals is something definitely needed in survival aspects. Resorting to whatever's around and finding a place to lie low is something any zombie survival expert can get behind. It definitely shows he can work with or without a team, but because of how brutal Left 4 Dead's infected are, going alone would just leave you left for dead. But his capabilities are definitely suited for optimal survival, even if they may seem brutal, reprehensible, and more. He is willing to get the job done and is a drifter that knows how to survive day to day. This means his survival preparedness is at a five out of five. So with that, we have the tallied up points for the Southern survivors finding themselves in an average ratio. Coming up even in their strength and survival preparedness with their proficiency in weapons being their greatest strength and cooperativeness widely being weighed down by one specific individual. Much like before, their strengths and weaknesses complement each other as they learn to work together to survive, although this time with a lot more back and forth banter. Both groups able to achieve more than most, but their immunities to the green flu definitely aid in their survival efforts and hell, maybe making them all slightly more durable against the rampaging onslaught of the infected due to mutative capabilities in their own bodies. At the end of the day though, they are survivors, but we are here to decide what group of survivors comes out on top. So, with it all laid out on the ground floor and the points delivered, let's see how one and two stack up against each other. We are going to be deliberating the points we can use an ancient method known as addition to put these points into grand totals. With that, I want you all to make your final guesses. Pause the video for a little bit. Before giving the final answer, I'd like to say there is no bias in my writings. I tried to be fair and balanced through and through. I genuinely like both cast of characters, and again, Left 4 Dead's one of my favorite games of all time. But also, I like the second group a lot more character-wise. I think they just have a way better dynamic. Now, with that, we have the results in. <clears throat> uh. 
Let me pretend like I have a piece of paper here. All right. <clears throat> the Left 4 Dead 1 survivors have come out with a total point average of a 56 out of 80 on the survivor team rating skill, putting them above average and working with what they got and doing what they can. So, how did things stack up for our second group? Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> Looking it over, the Left 4 Dead 2 survivors have come out with a 55 out of 80. Just one point short, they have lost to the OG survivors. No shot. I didn't plan this. Holy <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't expecting it to be this close. You can say I'm dialing this up for views or whatever, but damn. While Nick and Francis both don't do much for their team's cooperativeness and working to be more of the one that pisses off others the most, they balance themselves out in all other categories with criminal histories. Zoe and Rochelle both having experience in media and attempting to apply their helpful nature to their teams. Ellis and Lewis's blind optimism there to lift spirits to an annoyingly high degree with their attributes in intellect or raw determination. Bill and Coach being leaders slowed down by their own bodies who rally the group together to keep them mobile and functioning. This ultimately all depicts how basically even matched each group is, and how well the developers concocted their backgrounds, personalities, and synergies amongst each other to make a concrete foundation for the survivors to bounce off each other. Remember, at the end of the day, these people are not some badass agents sent out into the apocalypse to rend the dead like those found in Back for Blood, or find some kind of deep-seated secret conspiracy behind the virus like those in Resident Evil. These eight individuals were all normal people with their own personal stories, upbringings, and lives. They are survivors, and much like everyone out there, have their own strengths and weaknesses to offer in groups, and they were just living normal lives before it all went to hell. At the end of the day, we are saying it again, the Left 4 Dead 1 survivor come out with the 56 out of 80 with the Left 4 Dead 2 survivors at a 55 out of 80. Pretty evenly matched, but the OG survivors win by a very, very small margin. What did you think of this comparison vid of our eight survivors? Do you think I was off on some of the stats? Which group do you think is superior in terms of survivability? This is my first Left 4 Dead video in over a year, but I had to show my favorite game and my channel's OG content some love. That's about it this time. If you like what you saw, become a patron on the Patreon or a YouTube channel member by joining on the channel page to be a sexy survivor on this list here. Thank you for watching. I don't know what's next, but hopefully the next Left 4 Dead video won't be another year out. Never forget to stay happy, stay healthy, and most importantly, stay well, baby.